So a huge thank you to everyone for joining us. So very excited to be bringing you the Inspiring Women in Design, Construction and Data Workshop alongside Inspiring the Future. Um, just want to say another huge thank you to Woolworths for bringing this event to life um, and giving us the opportunity to get in front of all of you today. We've got an incredible lineup of speakers who are going to share some incredible insights into their career journey and how they got there. Um, but before we delve into that, we might share a little bit about us mm -hmm. and kind of how this event came about and what we hope you'll get out of it. Excellent. Oh, okay. This is me? Yeah, brilliant. So yeah, as Erin said, a bit about us and the event. Um, some quick housekeeping, I think we've already mentioned um, as you enter in, if you can make sure that your video is turned off and you're on mute. Uh, if you've got any questions throughout the presentations that you'd like to ask of the speakers, please just pop them in the chat function. And then at the end, when we've got the Q&A, we'll grab some of the questions out. Uh, we will also be recording today's session, so don't worry if you've missed anything. Uh, we'll be sharing the footage and that'll include the presentations so that if um, the students have any more questions, you know, you've got some information to kind of refer back to there. Um, we will kick off by saying a huge thank you to Woolworths and having a few words from Charles. Then we're just going to get straight into the guest, uh, guest presentations from all of our panellists. We'll do some questions and answers and then wrap up and say thank you to everyone. So um, for those of you who don't know us, this is Erin and my name is Althea. So I'm a design manager for Shape Australia and also the founder and national director for WIDAC. This is Erin. Yes, so lovely to meet you all. I'm project manager at Shape in the day and then I'm also national director of WIDAC alongside Althea. Great. So for those of you who don't know, Shape is a construction company. So Erin and I both work together. That's how we met, um, working together, doing mainly kind of office fit outs and we do some hotels and healthcare and education. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we met probably four years ago yep. uh, at work and we decided to go out and meet some different people in our network that we worked with. Uh, and kind of overnight, we decided to start a bit of a networking group so that we could meet with different people in our industry. And that might have been people who were engineers, uh, because in construction, you work with engineers and you work with certifiers and you work with designers and you work with architects and acoustic consultants and lots of different people. So we started um, WIDAC, which is a networking group, because we wanted to get to know other people in our industry and bring everyone together. So that's just a little bit about women in design and construction. Erin um, and I both work in the construction industry. I've worked in the construction industry for about 14 years this year. Uh, I stumbled upon it by accident uh, and it just really, really suited me as a person and the skills that I have. I'm extremely organized and I love working with people and I love dealing with um, trades and you know different consultants and bringing people together and um, project management sort of things. So yeah, for me, I found construction by accident and it, it absolutely has been such a great career path for me. And Erin kind of... Yeah, so I, I was similar in that I, I'll go back a little bit. So in school, I actually dropped out of school, which is probably not what you want to hear, um, to do full-time ballet. Um, when I figured I wasn't passionate about that at all, I was really lost trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And I um, kind of fell into retail. I just got a job in retail, which I really enjoyed. Um, and I was there for a few years. And while I was trying to find my feet, kind of after a long few years of ballet, I really didn't know where I kind of fitted in. Um, but I started studying interior design. Still have not finished my degree. Another thing you probably don't want to hear. But um, for me, I what I did, I got out there and I tried to find organisations I'd like to work with within those industries, so within construction, design, engineer. And I applied for really entry-level positions um, like office admin and things like that to just get my foot in the door because I knew from my experience in working in retail, I knew I could apply myself, I would work hard and I'd be able to work my way up. And that's what I've done over the last kind of three and a half years. I've changed, I think, six positions and moved up from admin now to um, from project coordinator to project engineer to project manager, um, you know, delivering multi-million dollar projects. So I think my probably takeaway would be don't discount work experience whilst it's really important, of course, to study and learn those skills. I think, um, 
you know, getting out there and really just applying yourself and having a good attitude. You hear that all the time, but it's, it's, it's true. It tr yeah, it's very true. And you need to, you know, go above and beyond and show that, um, potential employer how how you can kind of make a difference to their organization mm. and and what makes you stand out and for me that was harassing them until you know they gave me a job because I was that eager and keen and, and it paid off for me so that's probably something to consider as well you know mm. I, w I definitely didn't have a clear path of you know where I was going and I, I didn't you know see out my study just yet I probably will go back at some stage but um, yeah that's probably my key takeaway today yeah, so what we're hoping that um, everyone on the call will take away today, um, we've brought along amazing women um, to talk to you today from different jobs in different industries. Um, and they might be ones that you haven't considered before. Like we said, we found construction by accident. We hadn't really considered a pathway in construction because no one in our family worked in construction. I didn't know anyone you know, from school who was going into construction. So today, really like listen to all the presentations because it might not have been a job or a career or an industry that you had considered before, but it might actually really suit who you are as a person and the skill set that you have. Um, the girls are going to talk about what a day in their life looks like day to day, what they do for their job, who they work with, what they love about it, what they don't like about it, um, what, how they got there. Uh, and the, like Erin said, the big one is, you know, we both realized what we were good at. And then we've realized that this industry suits those skills and personality traits that we have mm -hmm. as a people, uh, as a person. So um, I hope today you take away, you know, for me in high school, there was so much pressure to decide what I wanted to do when I grew up, what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And actually, it's not about that. You don't have to decide what you want to do for the rest of your life. You just need to understand that it's about taking that next step. And you might take 500 steps before you realize where you were meant to be. We finally both realized where we were meant to be. But, take on um, different opportunities. You yeah. know, they might lead you down a completely different path you didn't know you wanted. So try not to get your heart set on, you know, one thing and think that's all you want to do. Because often people will go and pick something and study, you know, for four years, get into the job. And it's actually not really what they wanted to do. So mm. give yourself time to figure that out. And just as long as you work hard and apply yourself and learn those skills in whatever you're doing, you know, I guarantee you can apply that to other things and other roles. Definitely. All right. So enough from us. Um, we'd love to say a huge thank you to our event partner, Woolworths. They've made today's um, event possible. So a huge thank you to Woolworths. And on that note, we might introduce Charles Wheeler, who's their state construction manager. Yeah, he, um, he's going to say a few words. So over to you, Charles. Thanks both and a great introduction. So just again, thanks and welcome to everybody for joining online today. And uh, making time for this great event, which uh, we're, again, we're really proud to be uh, the main sponsor of. So we'd like to highlight is, Woolworths is obviously known for its huge retail presence, but uh, when we speak to people within the construction design space, they're often surprised that we manage the large portfolio of works directly through our in-house teams, uh, and are unaware of the amount of works that we actually control on an annual basis. Um, and to put some context around that for Woolworths, what we, under our construction and maintenance, departments, we control circa $1 billion worth of capital spend every year, which is a significant amount of money. Uh, and in order to do that, what we have got is the Woolworths format and network development team. So we've got a, a diverse national team of over 650 people. Um, and they're responsible for delivering retail experiences for the future, basically. We cover roles, everything from architecture, sustainability, planning, construction, facilities and asset management. Uh, and we also have data analysts, uh, refrigeration, and we're air conditioning people. So a really broad spectrum um, that we have across our talent pool. One of the reasons that we're proud to sponsor today's event is that we truly believe with a passion in developing talent and ensuring that Woolworths is a consideration as an employer of choice for the next generation that are coming through. And then given the large areas that we have, we, uh, we believe we have a unique opportunity for people to gain valuable experience across the multiple sectors, but all under the one company. Uh, which can provide a really exciting and challenging career. We strongly believe at Woolworths that our team members, uh, we provide them excellent working conditions. We have flexible working arrangements. Um, we're working in a really challenging and diverse space. Um, and the projects that we're working on are market leading. And we've got the, the visions to ensure our ongoing success. And the team we have behind us um, is really setting us up for the future. 
Uh, one thing we did want to highlight as well is that we've recently commenced a refrigeration apprenticeship program, which is really well represented mm -hmm. uh, by females, which is a real first for us in a, in a male dominated industry uh, and something we're really proud of uh, and really want to continue. Uh, and an, an event like this, you know, we see just such a great uptake. Um, I'm chatting um, with everybody before this. The, the amount of interest in this event and hopefully future events going forward, um, we can really leverage off, you know, how can Woolworths help and support in this environment and also get known that, you know, we're a great place to work with fantastic opportunities moving forward. Uh, and I think, as the girls mentioned earlier, uh, it's not, maybe not knowing exactly which one of those areas you may want to fall into today, but where it can take you uh, and the opportunities um, across a company like Woolworths where we have these diverse range of opportunities, if we can provide that. So look, I'm really looking forward to hearing some of the great journeys um, the panel are going to talk through today. Um, I'm going to be available for any questions, should you have them. Um, so look, thanks again. Um, I hope you enjoy the session. I'm really looking forward to it. Thanks so much, Thank Charles. Thank you so much, Charles. Perfect. Um, so we wanted to quickly say as well, um, thank you to our event partner, Inspiring the Future. They're the ones um, who we've partnered with and they're the ones who have reached out to all of the schools and have all the great relationships with all of you so that you could join us today. Um, a little bit about Inspiring the Future. Um, they're a free resource for teachers so they can easily connect with volunteers from the world of work, like we are today, through a secure and free online platform. In turn, the volunteers provide rich career conversations that raise aspirations and inspire and motivate young people from primary school age all the way up um, and to explore career options that they may not otherwise be aware of. Um, inspiring the Future helps challenge limiting socioeconomic, cultural and gender stereotyping of career pathways which have been found to take root in early primary school years. Um, definitely find out more and register with Inspiring the Future as a teacher or a volunteer at www.inspiringthefuture.org.au. So we're really excited. A huge thank you to Adrian for making this possible um, with we'll us send today. We'll details as well. So. Yeah. Because um, if you if this, this if this is how you found um, us today through Inspiring the Future, great. Please make sure that you share it and share the word. Um, okay, great. So we might we'll kick, kick on because we've got a lot to get through today. So we've told all of the ladies who are presenting today, keep it snappy. <laughs> you've got five minutes. Um, we're going to wrap you up when you've yeah. got 30 seconds left to go so that you know um, how we're tracking. So we'll we kick might off kick off with Hayley. Over to you, Hayley. Hayley Callahan. So can everyone hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, wonderful. All right, I'm going to keep it real snappy. Hello, everyone. My name's Hayley. I'm an interior designer in Brisbane, and I'm also a member of WIDAC. And today I'm going to be talking to you about what my uh, a day in the life of a commercial interior designer is. So next slide, please. So just a little bit about my journey. So I graduated from high school here in Brisbane in 2012. And when I finished high school, I still didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, I got an OP score, which is, I guess, like an ATAR score, which is way better than what I thought I was going to get. So I kind of freaked out. And uh, when I submitted my, um, uh, you know, my courses that I wanted to do at uni, I was like, oh, I'm pretty good at biology, I guess. So I did a Master of Dietetics at the University of Queensland. So I started that in 2013 and after about two months I realised, yeah, yeah, science is cool but I think I need to be doing something creative with my life. So I dropped out of uni and I took half a year to work full time and think about what it was I wanted to do. I did a bit of research and um, I found this thing called interior design. I thought, oh, I don't really want to fluff cushions and pick paint colours. And then I did some more research and figured out that it was actually so much more than that. So I enrolled myself into an interior design degree at the uh, Queensland University of Technology. And for the next four years of my life, I was hooked. Uh, I graduated in 2017. I worked at a few small architecture practices to get some experience while I was at uni. And then I started a full-time position at PDT Architects where I've worked for the past two years. And earlier this year, I took up a position at a firm called Thompson Adset, which is based in Brisbane. So next slide. So just a little bit about a day in my life. Uh, I always start my day with exercise, whether that be riding my bike to work, getting some sunshine, thinking about what it is I need to do in the day. I get coffee. That's pretty much fuel for a designer. Um, we just live off the stuff. 
And then my day can consist of anything from selecting finishes for a new project, doing some planning with the client about spatial diagramming, or if I've got a, a, a job I'm working on that's currently in construction, I might head out to site and check in with the builders and the engineers and see what it is that, that they're up to. And then uh, my day in the life today, I'm finishing my day talking at a WIDAC event tonight. So I love to go out and get out and about and network with my community. Um, and that's what I'm doing tonight. So next slide. I will say though, uh, disclaimer, interior design sounds really glamorous, but it's not all peachy. Uh, it's a very competitive industry. Um, it's very cutthroat and there aren't a lot of jobs actually in the industry. So if you you want to um, look at interior design, you need to make sure it's something that you're passionate about and that you're playing to your strengths. So for me, I love drawing. Um, I always did really well at art in school and I thought that interior design was a career where I could channel that passion and that talent um, because if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life or so they say. Um, in interior design, you really need to be a jack of all trades, be able to talk to people like Althea said before, um, be able to talk to builders, consultants, engineers, um, and manage multiple deadlines at once. So you're kind of juggling a lot of balls in the air all at the same time. And it is very hard work. Um, there have been days where I've been in at the office at six in the morning and then I go home and I open my laptop after dinner and I'm still working until two in the, the morning. Um, and I just need to say that because no one told me that when I enrolled at uni. Um, but, you know, I love it. I love what I do. Um, and so, you know, you just look at the clock and go, oh, God, it's 2 a.m. I must really love my job if I'm still working at 2 a.m. Uh, so next slide. I'm really motoring through. I'm at four minutes. So just to wrap up, I love interior design. I love being able to collaborate with fellow talented designers, whether it be architects, industrial designers, um, engineers, uh, builders, um, and the clients as well. Being able to take them on that journey from those sketches on the napkins all the way through to the built form that you see in that top photo there. That's a job I worked on at QUT, which has just been uh, completed construction this year. What I love about my job is that I get to design places that um, people love to be in. So I wanted to design uh, QUT to be the best university that you, you could go as a student and be the best student you could be. Um, another thing about interior design, just quickly, every day is different and every project is different. So I'm always uh, kept um, on my toes. Um, I never know what I'm walking into. Um, there's a lot of variety and I'm constantly challenged um, and inspired to be a better designer. Uh, if you want to reach out, my, uh, my contact details are there on the bottom of the slide. But I hope uh, that I've inspired someone to research what it is to be a commercial interior designer. Because I love it. And, uh, and I'm sure you will too. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Hayley. Great energy. <laughs> yeah. I'm very honest. Very honest. Yeah. We love it. So if you've got any questions for Hayley, pop them in the chat. And we will definitely get to them when we get to our question and answers later on. Okay, thank you, Haley. And now I think we're moving on to Misha. Welcome, Misha. Thanks, guys. Hi, my name is Misha. I just wanted to quickly also start by recognising um, the traditional owners of the land that I'm on today, which is Camaragle land in the Aurora Nation, which makes up part of Greater Sydney, um, and pay respect to this week, which is NAIDOC week as well. Um, if your school's doing anything to do with NAIDOC week, I encourage you all to get involved. It's a really it's a really fun time to learn more about our country and our people as well. So I'm an acoustic engineer. Um, can you go to the next slide? Probably no one knows what an acoustic engineer is. That's okay, because neither did I. Particularly when I was at school, I had no idea what it was. So I started in 2016 um, doing an internship at a recording studio, because I was really into music at school and I wanted to know what all the different knobs and things um, did on some of the mixing desks and stuff we had. So I started doing my internship and that led to me pursuing a career in music. So uh, as a producer and a sound engineer. So I went to uni also at QUT um, and I did a bachelor of music production and I began working in the music industry. So I worked um, in recording studios and also did a lot of live music, outdoor events, um, I had a pretty cool career actually. I worked at some big day out. I did um, 
sound and audio at Lady Gaga and Blink, uh, not Blink-182, sorry, um, uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers. It was like a lot of cool career highlights. It was pretty fun, but it was also really exhausting as well. Um, I'll get to that later. Um, one of the places I really wanted to work was Black Box Recording Studio, and they're a studio in Brisbane that did uh, Powderfinger, if you've ever heard of them. So they're kind of like an iconic Brizzy recording studio, and I really wanted to work there. And I was fortunate enough to start working there just before I finished um, graduating my degree. So I was a resident engineer there for a while. It's I, That's when I started to learn the music industry is actually pretty tough. It's... Um, Everyone's driven by passion, not money, which means <laughs> you don't always get paid for what you do, which kind of sucks. But um, I was very passionate about sound. I love sound and that's why I stuck at it. So I began working in corporate AV, so doing events. Um, like maybe if you've ever been to a conference or something, there's always someone down the back with um, behind the little screens doing all the sound. So I used to do that for sometimes small events, sometimes really big ones. And... Um, that was kind of a more consistent industry, but I still got to do sound, so I still loved it. In 2014, I was working um, at the G20, which was hosted in Brisbane. And in that, I got to work with, you know, some presidents and prime ministers from all over Australia. It was a very interesting, eye-opening experience. Um, but one of those events that I did was at a room in UQ, a building in Brisbane, um, and it was with the late Bob Hawke. Now, when I went and met him, I thought, okay, this guy is kind of old and mumbly. I'm going to have to, you know, really twiddle all these knobs to make it sound good. Like, it's going to be a bit annoying for me. And, you know, it's a hard job. And then, like, he started, like, did a sound check and he started talking and everything was perfect. And I was like, wait, I thought this would be really hard. So I started looking around the room and the room was just impeccably designed that every single aspect of the ceiling was acoustically designed to make the sound carry uniformly and like usually I worked in some pretty uh, not very good rooms um, and it was a struggle constantly to make something sound good in a room that sounds bad so that was my aha moment and I realized that you can actually make rooms make sound good so <laughs> I immediately investigated what this was and this job and I enrolled um, in the only place in Australia you can do acoustics, which is Sydney Uni. And I moved there um, and yeah, I moved to Sydney and I've, been, I've just realised I've gone way over time. So <laughs> I'm going to wrap up super quickly. Um, I started working as a consultant down here, moved up pretty quickly. I got promoted into a management position last year. I have presented at several conferences doing research in acoustics. And um, a career highlight was winning the uh, Narwick Future Leader Award a couple of years ago. And um, you can skip to the next slide, I'm way over. <laughs> um, my day basically, um, I spend some time in the office, um, in meetings and also on site. I do a lot of site work. So underneath all this, today I'm actually wearing my site boots and I'll be going straight on site after here today. I do lots of ex experiments and problem solving on site. Um, I think am I out of time now? Probably. <laughs> you got 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next slide, next slide. Um, so I chose acoustics because it challenged my brain. And same with any kind of consulting engineering. It's really, um, it's also very people-based. It's very challenging, problem-solving, and explaining really complex ideas to people like a designer or a project manager who doesn't know anything about acoustics. It's, it's really... Um, fulfilling being able to yeah have that engagement with people but also really challenge your brain yourself as well and challenge oh, I don't think I have time for this <laughs> I can keep going if you want me to um, just that yeah there is challenges a lot of challenges particularly in a male dominated industry I've certainly had a lot of challenges with that but I'm not going to sugarcoat it, but it's just there's so much support out there and surrounding yourself with really positive, inspirational people like all the ladies at WIDAC and all the men who are very supportive as well. Finding the right um, advocates um, in your industry or in your workplace is really, um, really important. All right. And let's wrap it up and say thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
All right, perfect. Thank you so much for that, Misha. If you've got any questions for Misha, um, make sure that you pop them in the chat. Um, she's got some great stuff in there, some great slides. So have a proper read of her slides um, when we send around the presentations later. Um, I've known Misha for the last couple of years and she's very inspirational and um, she's always out in the industry mm -hmm. presenting and talking, so yeah. And as you can see, she didn't start off in acoustic engineering. It was really, you know, it's always going to be about taking that next step and that next step. And, you know, there might be some different changes along the way and that's okay. All right. So moving right along, we have Lauren Harris. Welcome, Lauren. Hi, everybody. Uh, can you all hear me? Great. Hi, um, my name's Lauren. Um, I'm an architect in Brisbane um, and I work for a company called BPN. Um, we kind of do a huge amount of different types of architecture um, and we have about 300 people uh, across Australia and we also have offices in New York and in London. Um, so that's kind of what I do at the moment. Um, next slide, please. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about why I chose architecture. Um, for me, I went to high school on the Sunshine Coast. Um, so if any of you know Noosa or Mooloolaba, that's kind of where I grew up. I loved doing things that were creative. Um, you can kind of see in the slide that I did some pottery. I loved to bake. I liked to draw. Um, I loved puzzles. I enjoyed things that really was about creative problem solving, figuring out how things worked and strategic thinking. Um, and I did art at school. So I also really enjoyed figuring out how uh, a concept, um, taking you know a little inspiration from somewhere could turn into something completely different. Um, and I thought those skills were probably kind of match architecture. Um, I had this idea that architecture was a balance between something incredibly creative and something really quite tricky and detail focused and about sussing out um, how things would come together. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, and that's absolutely what architecture kind of turned out to be. I was lucky I kind of had a good idea of what it was. Um, but I don't think everyone really understands necessarily what architecture is. Um, I think there's a perception that it's about creating beautiful buildings and absolutely that is what we all love to do. Um, and these are some really great examples um, in Australia and also overseas of kind of what architects create. Um, so we do work on things like museums and libraries and houses. Um, every typology, every building type you could imagine an architect probably has a hand in that somewhere. Um, if we go to the next slide, please. Um, but architecture is also a whole bunch of other things that we don't really think about all the time. Um, sometimes it's about edges and parks and streets. So um, walking underneath an awning uh, down a beautiful tree-lined street, um, an architect or an urban designer or a landscape architect has a part in how that comes together. Um, architects also shape policy uh, for, if you think about our city plans, um, Melbourne is a great example of how uh, architects shaped the laneway culture um, and encouraged artists to, to be more um, prevalent in the city. Um, we do research and development. We really test building types and we also test materials. And we often tend to push things forward. So what you're seeing um, in the bottom image there is a beautiful curved shape. Um, and often what happens is an architect comes up with a crazy idea and we challenge people to try and make it happen. Um, it can really put pressure on some other industries, um, but that's what we all try and work together to kind of create spaces that people really enjoy and love. Um, and that's kind of what I get to do every day. Um, the other things I haven't mentioned are, we also really do a lot of strategic thinking and planning about how we can develop our cities and our spaces and the places we live for the future. Um, so all of that is kind of what we do, but really at the core, what architecture is, is about creative problem solving. It's about creating places for people, um, to live every day. It's about amplifying everything we do. Um, so imagine, you know, how your kitchen works at home, an architect might have a part in that. Imagine how you walk down the street, imagine your school that you are currently in. All of those things are, have, have been impacted by architecture. Um, 
Next slide, please. So what does my day actually look like? Um, if I'm doing all of that, you know, it can be really varied. Um, so I thought I'd mention, talk a little bit about actually what my year looks like, because um, my days can be incredibly different. Um, so at the end of last year, I was working on a health master plan. So that meant I was doing kind of underneath that analysis and forecasting picture. I was looking at population studies. I was looking at where growth is, and I was trying to figure out seconds left, Lauren. Okay. Um, where we needed more hospitals. Um, I also spent time kind of developing ideas. So I was doing that at the end of last year. And then um, some of the concept work and kind of figuring out what a building looks like. So some of the sketches you see on the left. And then my day can also be really heavy documentation. So figuring out how a window works, which is what you can see on the right. The next slide, please. So the pathway to architecture really quickly um, for me, uh, I was a pretty traditional path. So um, I went to, I did a bachelor degree for three years. Um, I took a year out. So I worked full time in the industry and I really understood what architecture was. And then I did a two year master's degree, which I actually did over three years. Um, and so it's a five, it is a five year degree. You do require a master's of architecture to be an architect. And there is a process that comes after that, which is registration which can take anywhere from, from two to five years. So it is a long road. Um, so if you're, going, if you're considering architecture, you should really need to be prepared for that. Next slide, really quickly. <laughs> Couple of things. Um, don't be afraid to go into architecture or anything else that you're interested in. Figure out what drives you, your passion, and don't be afraid to follow. Be brave, be bold. Um, don't be afraid to pivot, as the girls have mentioned. Not everything will always play out the way you expect it to. And taking what you've learnt and applying that to something new is actually where success comes from. The most successful people in the world are not usually people that have followed a linear path. So don't be afraid to pivot and to take a detour. And the last thing is to invest in people. Relationships are key. The people that you know today will carry you through. The people that you meet at uni will carry you through and be your peers. So they're really crucial to your career. So that's my last bit of advice. So thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much, love Lauren. It. Love it. Love it. And exactly right. You know, architecture is a long road. Lauren took the very traditional route in terms of she obviously knew what she wanted to do and she worked hard to get there. Um, but like she said, there's, there's lots of different things that will come up throughout your career. So always be willing to take a chance on something. I think it's important what she noted around people as well. Mm. That's really, a really key one. Yes. <laughs> All right, any questions for Lauren? Pop them in the chat and then we're moving straight along to uh, the beautiful Kira Legaritz. Kira. Hello, everyone. Um, can everyone hear me? Okay, cool. Um, so my name is Kira Legaritz. I am a client side project manager. I work for a company called TSA Management and we do pure client side project management. So what that means is we represent clients. So some of my clients have been aged care providers, infrastructure providers like rail, education, and right now I'm working for my client as air services. So we are building some air traffic control facilities, which is super cool. So next slide. Thanks. So just very quickly overline, overview of my very long career. I love that I've just followed Lauren because I am completely the opposite. I absolutely fell into what I'm doing, very much like the two girls, um, Althea and Erin. So I graduated high school and I'm like, yep, gonna be an accountant. I'm gonna study business and I'm gonna work in a corporate role. Uh, then I did work experience for a little while and I was like, nah, not doing that, not doing that for the rest of my life, that sucked. So I took a break and I traveled. I bought a ticket to the UK, didn't tell anyone about it. And I spent six months there just finding myself. I didn't worry about uni, didn't worry about study. I just met people and had a good time. Ultimately that led me here to Australia. So I should have started off by saying, obviously I didn't grow up here. I grew up in Canada. So again, completely opposite to a lot of the people who have spoken already today that the relationships that I built growing up have been left in, 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 uh, in Canada. And I've had to build completely new relationships here, which is part of the reason why I've gotten where I've gotten. So you'll see from that timeline, I, it's completely untraditional. I don't have a relevant degree in construction. I don't have any technical background. I just fell into it. I got a job with a project management firm um, in administration and I worked my way up from there. I put my hand up for things that I found interesting. People liked me and I quickly got promoted. And I've been really lucky to work on some of 
amazing projects. Um, and the other qualification I have is I got certified practicing project manager, which I did through um, basing, uh, based off my experience. Uh, next slide. Uh, so why did I choose it? I think I've pretty much covered that. I, I didn't I didn't even know it was a thing. I fell into it and I got, much like Haley said, I was hooked the minute that I started walking onto my first construction site. I was like, this is for me. Um, I've always been a strategic thinker. I loved numbers, but I knew I didn't want to be an accountant. I'm organizing things. I'm a planner. I really wanted to do something that meant something. And I always am looking for a challenge. Um, so next slide. Uh, day in the life of me is every day is so different. I'm a mummy, so once I've gotten my kids up and out the door, I sit and drink my coffee in my car. I often make a lot of phone calls. I get to work, um, I find a desk, I get in touch with my team, and then I do all of the things. So project management is very much a jack of all trades. As we represent the client, I can be doing anything from going to their office and packing, standing over their shoulders while they're packing boxes to move, to convincing them to make decisions, pulling people together to make decisions, problem solving, running design meetings, writing business cases, writing programs, um, doing, working with numbers, writing out a cash flow, so many things. Next slide. Uh, why do I love it? So there's lots of things on there and I'll let you read them. Um, but the biggest impact really from today that I want to talk about is if you look to the left in some of the pictures, those are some of the projects that I've had the pleasure of working on. Um, and some of them really change the shape of a city. So there are they're tangible. Um, the hard work that I do and the time away from my family, I can look, smell, feel, and touch. And it's really fun and challenging. Every day is different. I meet some amazing people and I don't even feel like it's a job. Every day is fun. We, we goof around um, on a day-to-day -day basis and we work hard and we can see, feel, and touch what we create. Next slide. Uh, so the ugly side. So again, on the left, there's some photos. Um, I'll let you read through some of the challenges that I've come because I'm running over time here. Um, but this project was one I worked on um, in 2012 where a crane caught on fire and fell over. Luckily, no one was physically hurt, but the mental health impact from that project was enormous. So that is probably the biggest thing that I would say that is hard in my job in a day-to-day -day basis is learning mental resilience. There's a lot of things that are hard in this industry and you need to make sure you're looking after yourself and looking after your colleagues, looking after your workmates, um, not just from a physical safety perspective, from a mental health perspective, because it's, it's a really tough industry. It's bloody fun and I love it every day, but it's really hard. Uh, next slide. Um, so that's really it for me. Um, I'll let you read through all of my advice there. But my biggest advice is just don't make any big decisions right now about the whole rest of your life. I am in my late 30s and I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. I fell into this career and I love it and I'm hooked. But the most the most that I get out of it is the experiences that I've had in my life. So traveling around, volunteering, being a sponge, asking people questions, taking the time in my life to really figure out what I wanted to do, who I wanted to be. And when I didn't like it, I just stopped, took a breather, traveled, volunteered. And um, that's just my biggest advice. Thank okay. you so much, Kira. <laughs> Great advice. Lovely. All right. We're going a little bit over. So uh, the next person is going to be super quick. I can just feel it. Um, and the next person is uh, Siobhan. Is it Siobhan? Siobhan? Yes. Siobhan. All right. Uh, Siobhan, you're going to have to be the fastest. Here we go. I, oh, my God. Okay. I've probably got the most sl slides. Nick, um, can you see me? Can you see me? Yeah. Okay. So when I go like that, change slides. So you can change slides. Okay. So architectural lighting designer, what do I do? Um, I give a nighttime and daytime presence to architecture, interiors and landscapes through the use of light. Um, today, well, a lot of people don't know what architectural lighting entails. Um, so I'd like to give a little bit of an insight into what light actually is and what it does. So light is an, uh, an ephemeral essence which allows us to see. It illuminates, creates shadows, defines objects, textures, space and distance. Next. Please. Thanks. It um, 
It enhances buildings and spaces. Next. And it can heighten one's senses, shift our perception, and offer new experiences. Next. And light can also transform the look of solid objects and buildings. So as you can see, this Sydney Opera House, and then it's totally transformed with the use of light. Next slide. Um, this is Hong Kong. This is, I moved to Hong Kong when I, after I graduated from architecture. And uh, Hong Kong is probably the most significant city in my journey to light. So the building that we see, this was the first color changing facade in the whole wide world. And it was designed by a lighting designer called Jonathan. And he has been the most important influencer in my life, apart from my parents, next. Um, so he, I was working for an architectural firm and he approached me to come and work for him. I didn't really know that much about architectural lighting design because back then in Australia and particularly in Melbourne, the lighting design of this caliber wasn't very um, prominent. Um, so I looked at the type of work he did, jumped on board and was project director for his company and oversaw a Cyberport Cyber Center, which was the biggest development in Southeast Asia at the time. Um, and concurrently also looked after lots of different projects um, that we had and the team of lighting designers next um, under that same umbrella um, Jonathan had a publishing um, a publication which had been left dormant so I saw the potential in that so we revamped that lighting links directory and created an international lighting magazine called switch so this this uh, both of these fields allowed me to travel the world to lighting and design fairs interview and meet some of the most amazing influential designers of the time, such as Ingo Maurer, Philippe Stark, um, Marcel Wanders, etc. Next slide, thanks. So how did I get to Hong Kong and be a project director and work <laughs> on these projects and run my own to then lead me to Brisbane? Um, so I lived in Melbourne and after high school, I went to RMIT and studied architecture there. I did a couple of years there and needed a bit of a break. So London called mm -hmm. and I traveled to London, lived there, traveled around Europe solo, which I highly recommend. It's the best achievement ever at that age. Went back to Melbourne and changed to the University of Melbourne and I graduated architecture there. Six months later, I was asked to, I had a job opportunity in Hong Kong um, for an architectural practice. So I moved there. And then, as I said before, when I was working there, I got approached by Jonathan to work in lighting and, and lighting is just such an amazing field. And I totally fell in love with it and was absorbed by it. Um, but unfortunately, even though amazing opportunities working with Jonathan, I just, wanted to go back home. So moved back to Melbourne after about four years in Hong Kong and worked at Euroluce. Never thought I'd be in a sales role. So Euroluce are suppliers of some of the world's best um, lighting um, products from architecture to, uh, to decorative products. And, but I saw a potential there to work for them because I not only did sales, but I worked as a lighting consultant and worked on numerous um, projects, um, you know, uh, hospitality, retail, commercial, residential, yep. and got to meet one. <laughs> Sorry? Yeah, 30 seconds. Oh my God. Sorry, guys. <laughs> um, so I worked there. Then I, uh, in Sydney and Brisbane, then went to WSP and did lighting design. Then I started my own <laughs> practice. Um, and I also got into interior design as well. So let's just flick through some of the slides. So this is just showing, say, um, a concept board with different lighting effects for a project. The next slide, more concept. That slide that we're on is Dialux which shows lighting levels for projects, so lux levels. Next slide is a typical plan of that. Then luminaire schedule, next slide, next slide. Uh, luminaire schedule, next slide, on-site report, and then the finished product. This is me creating a light sculpture for another project, next slide. And then these are just some snapshots I've taken, so not very professional photography. 
Um, but, you know, just it's so nice to have a project complete and be able to go and experience it. And then just words of wisdom, follow your heart, take as many opportunities as you can that resonate with you, learn as much as you can from every single job experience, learn as many CAD programs as you can because that's what you get. Uh, gets a job for you in the industry and when you're at university you try and go and work for a company in your profession and be open and interested to a wide range of things and be passionate as well Perfect. and thank these you are so just much, project well done. anyway thank you <laughs> fantastic very cool some great projects there lovely so we'll get um, everyone to have a bit of a look through Siobhan's slides and take a closer look at all the really cool pictures and information in those. Um, but we will move right along now to Ruth. Welcome, Ruth. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. So my name is Ruth DeRosa. I'm a Senior Contracts Administrator, uh, currently working for Barper Construction Services, which is a majority Indigenous-owned business. Um, in a nutshell, what my role is, is sort of commercial, health, safety, environmental and quality controls in a project environment. Uh, next slide, thanks. Look, going through these five sort of different points through this presentation today was really interesting and a good exercise in self-reflection and, and how I've gotten to the path or the place that I am now. Um, we'll talk to each of these points. All right, next slide. And then the next one. <laughs> Okay, so uh, similar to Misha, I think it was, um, I came from a, a bit of an alternative background as well. So I'm a professional flautist. So I started, I left school and um, went straight to the conservatory of music after having a year off of travel and uh, performed, um, recorded two albums with a, with a band I was in and taught professionally for, for a number of years. I then graduated in 2004, went on some travel and decided then to go um, live in London for a year. Now, when I came back, uh, me and my now husband, uh, we returned and I was like, well, I don't really want to teach all the time anymore. Um, I was sick of doing all these wedding gigs. Uh, <laughs> there's not that much out of work out there for flute players. So I just got a part-time job at Cougar Cochrane, what it was called at the time, but Cochrane Construction and just an admin. And... Interestingly enough, they, they sort of spotted that I had, um, you know, hunger in me to learn more and they gave me an opportunity to go out to uh, be document control in IKEA at Tempe. Um, this was an accidental introduction into building. I had, I had no idea what was involved in building, building a, a, a project and that sort of exposed me to all these different roles and, you know, just not just from the head contract, but all from the consultants, the engineers, uh, the clients. Um, so I sort of... Then, you know, sat down with my senior management and decided to go back and do my construction of uh, project man management of, uh, at UTS. And, um, and that was the beginning of that path. Now, I then had decided we had, had a, decided to have a baby in the second year of uni. So, look, study, um, work, baby was extremely stressful for me, but we kept on going, pushing through. Next slide. Okay, so... 2014, I uh, got promoted to contracts administrator, which was a great opportunity. And then in my final year of study at UTS, I had the opportunity to do some tutoring and lecturing. So um, that was, you know, I've got some great colleagues now at UTS that supported that. Um, my last year of uni, I had the opportunity to go to Japan, Vietnam, and also the Maldives to do some subjects for study. Um, and the most phenomenal experiences of my life, uh, volunteering in the Maldives and also seeing how construction worked in, in Vietnam and, and Japan. I think um, it changed it changed a lot for me. Uh, I then graduated in 2015 and uh, kept on going down this path, ticking off the projects and uh, decided second baby should come along. So 2017, number two came. I was really on a trajectory at this point and didn't want to have too much time off. So I had, I think, 11 weeks off. Um, my husband stayed home sort of part-time after that, which was fantastic, which gave me the opportunity to keep on developing my career. Went into senior CA role. And uh, then early this year, I moved over into the BAPA business, which is just the most fantastic business. And I'm so excited to be part of it. And that's where I am now. Um, here, I won't go, go into detail here, but this is a bit of a snapshot of all the project experience, also the teaching experience and the um, opportunities on the NARWIC board back in 2010 to 2013. 
Um, so I've had a wide range of experience through resi, uh, fitness centres, pools. I'm now working on a defence base, um, IKEA, etc. So I'll let you have a look through those later. Why I chose this path? <clears throat> look, it's 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 there's so many sort of words here. I'll get you go to the next slide. Um, I had I was I was driven. Okay, my um, I wanted a challenge. I was ready to do something different. I wanted personal growth. I worked really, really hard, and I needed to. I needed to channel that somewhere. And to be perfectly honest, pardon. Thirty seconds. Oh no. Oh, anyway, no. senior management enabled that and um, gave me this path and, and supported that. Next slide. So day in the life. Okay, so I'll let you read through it. Um, it's pretty, pretty busy, chaotic day to tell you the truth, um, but I love every second of it. Well, not every second, most days I do love every second. Next slide. Next slide, challenges. Okay, um, personality clashes, difficult projects, time pressure. Um, everyone else has said it, you are under the pump all the time. As a head contractor, you are responsible for delivering the project. Um, it is, the, it is a risky uh, role to be in, but the challenges are worthwhile. Um, it, it, and you have to just, you have to trust other people to do their jobs properly. Um, you have to manage them, but you have to trust them. Uh, COVID-19 has been a, been a cracker of a year as well. Next one, and benefits. Um, I'm role model to my daughters. That's a huge thing. Um, collaboration with people, continual problem solving, like anticipating the problems before they happen is what I have learned to do. It is invaluable and you learn more and more every day. Um, and also the mentoring and, and educating younger staff and older staff, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> Everyone's still learning. Um, and last couple of slides, uh, recommendations and advice. Out of these items here, um, I think learning comes from mistakes. Uh, it's a tough, fast moving industry, but you've got to embrace it and don't let it get to you. Every day is a new day. Um, and also, I think the second last one there, we're choosing a path give it a proper chance because no decision is final, you know, and you need people around you um, that support that. So, and also get your butts overseas and see how it works around the world. It's a big item. Great Thanks. advice. Thank you so much, Ruth. Yeah, Erin um, and I, like Erin's hoping to go traveling soon. I did about a year and a, no, nearly two years overseas. And yeah, I learned so much about myself and um, you know, what it looks like in the other countries. And I actually appreciated Australia a lot more when I moved back home. <laughs> so I think travel's always a really good one. All right, we're moving right along now and we've got the amazing Adele. Take it away, Adele. Hi, um, I'll be pretty quick, I think. Um, so basically, my, I'm Adele Taylor. I work as a construction project manager at Woolworths. Currently, I've been there for about three years. Um, how I got into construction, again, I really fell into it, like a lot of the other um, guys that have spoken today. Basically, I left school, did a degree in marketing because a lot of my friends sort of were, didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, I enjoyed shopping. I wanted to be, at that point, I was like, you know what, I'm going to be a buyer. I'm going to go travel the world, be a buyer. It, like, why, why not? So I actually got a job in Maya as a buying assistant in the buying department. Loved it. Did about three years in different roles, bits and pieces. Um, but it seemed to be the same. I felt a bit the same every sort of day. Um, and then I basically just had an opportunity to work as a project analyst. Um, Maya was doing four new stores pretty quickly. They didn't have a project department. So I sort of said, do you want to have a crack? And so I did and loved it. I was the same, addicted, wanted to do more, loved turning something old into something new and beautiful and the team that you handed over to love it amazing um so from there i was lucky enough to then get an opportunity to work on the my melbourne project which um down in melbourne uh, was a 310 million dollar redevelopment um took about five years five long years um but i loved every minute like i didn't know a lot about project manager at that point and i was involved in every every design every meeting um from you know the the basic design of the building to the fit outs in the building, um, my probably one of my career highlights would definitely be Mural Hall. I don't know if anyone's been to Melbourne up to Mural Hall. Amazing! It was a heritage listed hall. It got revamped um, to its original form. Amazing! I think I cried when it opened. But um, yeah, so that was really good. Did that for about five years. Um, went and had a baby. Went back to Maya for another few years. Um, did a lot of jobs in Sydney. Uh, had a second baby and then just decided most of the jobs at that point were in 
Sydney. I need to do something in Melbourne to be closer up with my family and got a job as a construction project manager at Woolworths, um, which I love. I love, it was close to home. Everyone's really supportive. Um, they're very, um, everything's very flexible. You can work when you need to work, if you need to do personal things. It's very family orientated, great values. And it's such a big company. There's so many areas that you can go into. Um, you've got property, you've got construction, you've got your fixtures, you've got um, refrigeration, which is a big part of Woolworths. Um, so yeah, since I've been at Woolworths, I've done a lot of projects, small refurbishments, to new stores. Um, I had a great opportunity to work on the Camberwell as a concept store, which I loved. Um, also worked on Burwood Brickworks, which is the first sustainable living building challenge um, retail center in the world, basically. Um, so from that, I learned a lot more about myself. Like I didn't realize how into sustainability I was. Um, so yeah, that's been really good. And I've learned, I, I think too, with project management, you learn something new every day. Like I still, every project I go on to, there's something, whether it's something in the soil or something with the building, you pull a building apart and it's not what you think it's going to be. Um, so yeah, I mean, I learn stuff every day. The day in the life is different every single day. It depends on how many projects you have on what you have on. Um, I love it. I love the different people. You talk to the builders, the contractors, your painter, your um, development managers, your um, landlords. There's, you're talking to so many different people every day. Um, a big thing for me, um, being a woman in construction, I have never had any issues. Um, I've never found any problems with people not respecting me or I think if you know what you want and know how to get across what you need done, I think people will respect you. So I don't, I haven't found any issues with that really. I've been in big arguments in meetings with developers, um, unions, you name it. I've been there, done that. And, it, and it's all sort of worked out for the best. Um, a big thing for me is I had a really good mentor. Um, I had a lady when I went into project management that pushed me into it. I think as women, sometimes we don't really, we worry about, can we actually do it? What should we do? do it. I, I agree with everybody that said, take the opportunities. If you get into it and you don't like it, there's a hundred branches, hundred different places that you can go. Um, yeah, I've loved it. I've loved, I've made really good friends in most areas that I've been in, most projects that I've been in. Um, yeah. And just, just trust yourself, back yourself. It's hard work, but when you finish something, can you see the end of it and you hand it over to a team or whoever, and they love it. You feel really satisfied. It's a very satisfying job, I find. So, um, so yeah, that's really it for me. Just find a mentor for sure. Whether it's a student, a teacher, someone in your job, someone that you can vent to. Um, and yeah, good luck. Amazing. Thanks, Thank Adele. you so much, Adele. Perfect, perfect, perfect. And then we've got the last but not least, Sophie. And then after Sophie, we um, will do some questions. So over to you, Sophie. Hey everybody. Yeah, I'll try and be really quick. I know we're running out of time. Um, Anyway, yes, I'm Sophie Denford. I work in asset advisory and at the moment I work in digital engineering, which is a relatively new field. Um, what <laughs> our line is, digital engineering connects emerging technologies with reliable structured data. It enables us to build our assets. So that's uh, railways, roads, ferries, you know, all the buildings everyone's talked about. We're able to build them virtually in 3D before um, we actually build them physically. And it's all about, yeah, defining, connecting the data. Um, it might not sound interesting, but um, I really enjoy what I do. Um, my career path, again, you know, I, I did fall into construction and engineering. I started off doing um, a Bachelor of Science in Psych and Speech and Hearing. And I guess one of, one of the th key things I'd like you to take away is that I really see my career as starting before that. So, you know, during high school and during my university degrees, I worked, um, you know, for Sizzler and Pizza Hut and as a speech and drama teacher. Um, I was a teacher's aide and I gave respite care to disabled kids. And really those little jobs, I learned so much in dealing with, different people and appreciating their worlds and just getting some core sort of organizational skills down and and things like that so you know as well as my formal 
education, I think those, those things were pivotal um, in forming who I am and where I got to in my career. Um, I fell into my job, I guess I went to, um, I went to the UK and I got a job with um, British Gas over there and that was just a temp job and I ended up being there for two years because I really enjoyed the atmosphere and the camaraderie and they, you know, they offered me a, a longer term job under their graduate program but I came back to do my Masters of Speech and Language Pathology. Um, for different reasons, you know, I ended up deferring that after six months and I ended up getting a job with the gas company in Sydney. And, you know, my experience in the UK helped, but also just, you know, my enthusiasm, um, being pretty good with technology, having common sense and, you know, a, a logical um, strategic view of things um, mm. really set me up well there to try different roles. And also, you know, they offered me um, my MBA to put me through my MBA. Um, so yeah, that was a bit of a moment where I decided not to go back to do my speech things and, and stay in the construction industry. And I guess one thing to take away is that, you know, you are helping society and the community in construction and doing these roles as well. Um, I'll skip through, I know we're out of time. So do you wanna go through to the next one? My life, you know, it's pretty busy with my two kids, but at the moment, you know, I'm not on site that much anymore, but, the thing I enjoy most is working with my team and really, you know, testing and stretching each other and having a collaborative environment um, and challenging our ideas and, and coming up with better solutions and the way we do things. And it's all around data and technology and IT and things like that. It's not physical buildings. But again, it's those same types of skills, I suppose, and problem solving. And there's some of the opportunities. And I think, you know, working in a big... Um, a big um, multinational com company like GHD, you know, it's an Australian company, but I was able to work in the UK and in New Zealand and around Australia and the States as well. Um, people, of course, they're, they're the best in the job and the, and the biggest challenge in the job, working with different people. And also they'll take you places. You know, I didn't know anything about the different roles I'd get through my career and the, the industries I was working in, but I think it was the skills I had rather than the knowledge that got me to where I was. Um, I can see we're losing people having to sign off. So I guess they're my, they're my key um, messages to you. Um, I'll pass it back to you guys. Everyone can read my slides in your own leisure and I'll pass it back to you to, to wrap up, I think. Amazing. Thank Thanks you so, so much, Sophie. Um, I think one thing that was really good to see in all the presentations today before we do jump into questions was, um, and I'm a, a new mum as well. I had a baby 10 months ago, my beautiful son. Um, and you would have seen in a lot of the presentations today, a lot of a lot of us have gone and had families and you can go back to work after a family. There's really great companies out there. My company's great. I know Woolworths is great. And it seems like all of the other panelists today who've had babies throughout the career have been really well supported by their workplace while they're raising a family and, you know, getting back into their career. So um, I hope everyone took lots of different um, tips and advice away from all of the um, beautiful panelists that we had present today, talking about what they love about their jobs, what they do, um, how they found it. I think you, you've realised that there's lots of different ways to find that perfect job for you and it might not always um, be obvious to you now, but you, you might stumble across it. Um, all right, so we might quickly just jump into the questions. We've had some good questions. I did see one earlier. Um, some general tips on making connections. Um, I might, probably talk to I'll quickly <laughs> talk about that one and then hand it over. I think a few of the ladies have talked about it. It's, it's going to be even starting where you are right now. Um, for me, when I wanted to leave school and think about study in my first job, I said, mum, I need my first job. Do you know anyone who is um, employing anyone? You know, I would be happy to take an admin role. Um, and my mum said, well, my friend Josie's got a um, an events agency and I think they're looking for a receptionist. So start with your own network first. So ask your mum, ask your dad, ask your aunt, you know, have they, ask your cousins, has, ha, do they work in different companies or different industries or do they know someone who can introduce you to maybe some work experience? So, um, and then as you go to uni, you'll build more connections. Uh, there's lots of different industry groups out there as well. 
so I, I think there's, there's a lot of different ways that you can make connections, but it's always just about putting yourself out there and asking for people to introduce you to others that might be able to help as well. Start at the very beginning. Anyone else from the panel want to add anything on that one? No? Hi, this is Lauren. I just thought I'd say I, um, I actually got my job uh, through my first job through my old physics tutor. Um, so it can really start from anywhere. He was a neighbor of my, of my grandparents um, and helped me through school. And I, you know, kept in touch with him. And he's the one that kind of helped me um, kind of, he was, he introduced me to the first architect I, I'd ever met. Um, and I had no other connections in the industry. And I just, I think really like all relationships are valid and I would encourage everyone to show up with respect and energy and throw themselves into things. Um, Cause you never know who you're gonna meet that is able to help you down the track. Exactly right, exactly right. Um, I couldn't see any other questions in there, but I might- yeah, there are some, are there? Yeah, do you find these industries are more open to female involvement and perspectives? Does anyone want to jump in here and share their thoughts? Um, I'm happy to. Um, I feel that um, being a woman in construction, because there isn't a lot of women, I do think that you do get some opportunities that potentially you might not get in other industries where there are a lot of women, just because we have a different way of thinking about things. We do things differently. Um, yeah, I, I do think we do. And I think it's great. I definitely yeah. agree with Adele um, and Adele mentioned before that she's always been really, you know, well supported as a woman um, mm. working in construction. Erin and I have always found that to be the case as well. I've always had fantastic yeah. male champions who've supported me and, you know, great male and female colleagues. Um, and I've always loved it and I've, not, I've never had a bad experience or been told no for any reason. There are always people that will have bad experiences though too, mm. which I think is important to note. And, you know, it's just about finding kind of the right companies and the right advocates mm. um, and knowing to, you know, move on or find somewhere else if, you know, it's not the right place because, <laughs> again, not everywhere is going to be perfect and supportive. So it's probably important to think about that too. Mm. Um, there's a question around would all the panelists be happy to connect with students on LinkedIn? I think I can say yes on behalf of all of them. I think so, most of them have said yes. <laughs> so that's really good. Um, um, there was... No tip of hello Oh, yeah. Yep, any extra questions, email them through to hello at widac.com.au. Um, I think I might just ask one final question. So um, for all of our panellists, if you just want to say uh, the absolute, the coolest project that you've worked on this year, really quickly. Um, for me, um, it was Arcadia Defence Housing Australia, which is at um, Alexandria. It's 400,000 recycled brick facade. There's beautiful giant timber portals. I mean, I say that a lot of people have driven by it's on the corner of Sydney Park Road. Um, it was the most challenging project I've ever worked on and to see it how it is now and it is so spectacular and I'm so proud of delivering that from the beginning to the very end. Still going. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, Misha? Um, yeah, this year, probably one of my most exciting things is a project I've been on for a few years, but it's all coming together, which is a $2 million uh, fit out for NAB um, in the city, in Sydney. And that's all Green Star and well certified. So there's some really cool, innovative um, things happening there and really good acoustics. <laughs> so, awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Misha. Adele? Um, this year would be Burwood Brickworks, the um, Sustainable Living Building Challenge project. Um, yeah, as I said before, amazing. Everything was recycled. It basically can sustain itself. And I've learned a lot about myself because of it. Amazing. Thank you. Hayley? Uh, this year, um, I had a photo of the QUT International College. It was a multi-million dollar refurb of P Block at uh, QUT University. Um, and I got to be part of that project from the very, very first client meeting all the way through to this uh, handover on site. So that was a, a big one for me. Awesome, thanks so much, Hayley. Lauren? Uh, this year it would have to be working with uh, redeveloping a hospital in Brisbane. We are working with 
users on the ground who are in hospitals every single day, um, nurses, clinicians, doctors, um, and to sit down and work with them about how to create spaces that are better for them and for better for patients has just been the most fulfilling thing of the year. Um, so that's been probably the highlight this year. Awesome, Kira. So this year I've been working on projects for Air Services Australia. So um, it's for the OneSky program, which is bringing together the way that air traffic control works in civil and military. Um, I never knew anything about air traffic control before doing this project. And it is astounding what these air traffic controllers have to do on a day-to-day -day basis and how hard their job is. And whether there's one plane in the sky or 45,000 planes in the sky, it's a necessary uh, it's a necessary profession and it's, it's very interesting industry to be working in at the moment um, in the current global environment. Cool. Thank you very much, Kira. Who have we got? Siobhan? Very quickly. Um, yeah, very quickly. Probably, well, I've just finished a 53 dwelling um, development where I did the interior design, exterior design and the lighting, which was pretty, you know, cool having just entered back into the interior design situation, but also making that neon sculpture was really fun as well. So, you know, quite small doing something hands-on and then something, you know, quite large is that big development, yeah. Awesome, thank you. Ruth, I think, I think Ruth, second last, Ruth. Oh no, we might have lost Ruth. We started with Ruth. No, I, po I popped up first, popped up yeah. first. Ah, oh, we've had you Ruth, sorry. Uh, Sophie. Yeah, I guess um, for me, We've just brought in roads into transport at the minute. So we've been working on rail projects and now we're um, adapting our framework to to cater for roads as well. So it doesn't sound very exciting, but it's been a big, big job this year. All right, perfect. Did I miss anyone or? No, we've had everyone. Okay, cool. Um, Erin, what was the coolest project you've worked on this year? Um, probably Mosaic Property Group. It was a very high quality project and I loved the interior so that was great. It was beautiful. Yeah. I worked on that one with Erin. Um, best project I worked on this year was having a beautiful baby because <laughs> I've been off work this year having a baby but I'm back at work now. So um, we might quickly wrap up and say thank you. So a huge thank you to the sponsors who sponsor WIDAC. Um, that is CGC and Shape and Ortex. They're our fantastic sponsors. Thank you. Um, and thank you to all of our beautiful guest presenters, our incredible event sponsor, Woolworth. Um, thank you so much for making today possible, inspiring the future, and for everyone for dialing in. I hope yeah. everyone had a great time. We hope you got a lot out of it. hope you got a lot out of it. Yeah. We'll share all of the slides and the recording in case you had to go when you wanted to watch the end of it. 